Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Startup Sense podcast. This is your host, Jonah Lupton. Thank you so much for joining us today. Excited to have you. So on the phone, we have Nora Levinson. She is the founder of a company called Caden. Um, Caden was started about three years ago. They've raised $1.6 million from some investors, uh, less than 10 employees based in New York. And what the company essentially does is they've combined kind of fashion, wearable technology. So they're, they've built uh, headphones and bracelets and whatnot that are connected and uh, mostly focused on the wellness and health space. And hopefully I got all that right. But let's welcome Nora. Nora, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me. You're very, very welcome. Um, how did I do in that intro? Did I describe the company well? Or maybe you should yeah. do it better. You do a better <laughs> format. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you got all the major points. We're, we're a couple of years old. Um, you know, our mission is to use design and technology to inspire dynamic and engaged living. And we started that out with our Linea collection of headphones, like you mentioned, um, that we first launched the brand with. And then last year, we launched our Sona Connected Bracelet for Mind and Body, which it uses a, a really advanced new metric uh, to basically help us not only do great activity tracking, we also do stress and meditation. So those are kind of the, the key high-level uh, points to know about us. Now, maybe you could tell us about your background and the background of the team, because you guys have a ton of experience in these markets, right? Yeah. So I've been in consumer electronics for you know about a decade now, uh, including about five years in China, where I lived and worked you know directly with the manufacturers uh, day to day. So my background's mechanical engineering. Um, I did my undergrad at Stanford in product design and my master's in mechanical engineering there, focusing on mechatronics and embedded systems. Um, so, you know, from there, I spent time working at Incase, uh, Jawbone, Skullcandy, and Harman uh, at the Harman Kardon and AKG brand. So a lot of that time was in China at the factory overseeing manufacturing and development. Um, in terms of our, my other colleagues, uh, David Watkins, who's my co-founder, He's coming more from the design side, and he worked with me at several other of those co- same companies in case uh, Skull Candy, uh, Jawbone, um, and then our COO uh, Skip. He previously Skip Orvis. He was actually my boss when I was at Jawbone, so I was uh, <laughs> lucky to get him to come over. Uh, he comes from an electrical engineering background, and before that was at Apple for a better part of a decade. Um, and our CMO Soyeon Park, uh, she comes from the fashion world. She was uh, the director of global marketing for Donna Care and DKNY brands uh, before we we got her over to come work with us. Awesome. Now, when did you decide to start this company and what was the problem that you saw? And, you know, I guess with that, what problem are you trying to solve? Yeah. So when we were starting Caden, one of the biggest things that had been frustrating for David and myself, particularly living and working in China, we'd been working on other people's products for a really long time and really knew how to build good quality product. Uh, but we also were looking at the, the design uh, aesthetic, which is really from David's perspective, you know, and it was always very frustrating to us that whenever something came out that was a little bit more high design or stylishly designed, the technology was very old. So we wanted to be able to blend those two and not have to compromise on either. But when we think about what we're doing with the wearables, you know, the big story behind that was really trying to help more with people finding balance and managing their stress, which for me was an even bigger problem than the physical fitness aspect that most wearables worked on. So, you know, I'd worked on wearables uh, on previous companies that I'd been at, and we were always solving the same problem of how to get someone to take more steps, be more physically active. But for me, be, you know, living and working in China and being at the factory every day, um, it was really more about how do I keep myself from burning out and, you know, learning some techniques for that. So we really wanted to, when we started working on building the Sona Connected Bracelet, uh, we wanted to focus on solving that problem for people rather than just another step counter. So you would so you would buy the bracelet and then you would download the Caden app and then that would give you access to all the tracking data? Yeah, so the, the Sona Connected Bracelet itself, we measure heart rate uh, steps, but also something called heart rate variability, which is a really new metric in terms of consumer products, but it's got a really long background on research history going back to the Russian cosmonaut program in the 1960s. And so we've been working with scientific advisors who've helped us basically 
take all the research that has been going on for decades and build that into our app, our Caden app. Um, and in the app, basically, you can track your daily activity uh, via heart rate. You can track your daily HRV, which helps you understand the stress your nervous system's under. And then we have our resonance breathing meditation, which is guided breathing meditation in sync with your heart patterns. Uh, that's all measured via the bracelet. Cool. And what makes the headphones so special? Yeah, so for the headphone side of things, we're all super huge audiophiles. You know, coming from the background that we have, we've built a lot of audio products in the past. And we wanted to build something that could use premium material, but at a more approachable price point. So rather than having to spend three, four, five hundred dollars to get something that, you know, had these metal accents, these vegan leather, and felt uh, very premium, we thought that 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 should be more approachable. Um, and we built in an acoustic design profile that also works really well. It's not completely flat, so it, it works well with um, more lively music. There's a kick in the bass, but it also has you know a really great profile for listening to jazz or anything with good vocals. So we wanted to, to build that profile in uh, that could work in kind of both worlds. So take us back a few years when you decided to put this company together and assemble the team and come up with some prototypes. What did that look like? I mean, <laughs> creating the prototypes, I mean, obviously you have manufacturing experience in China and you probably have a, a nice head start on how to get this all together, but uh, give us some insights. Yeah, so one of the biggest advantages that we had going into this was relationships with factories in China. Um, we'd already built products like this before at scale. So we knew who we wanted to work with, and that allowed us to make smart decisions about you know, where we chose to source the product, but also it allowed us to have a good partnership up front and get a little bit of support from the manufacturers as we were going into our early prototyping, soft tooling, and getting all of that built. So you know, I think for other, in terms of other startup founders, a lot of people are, are getting the same advantages by going through accelerators or incubators that can help them with those relationships. So we were uh, lucky enough or, you know, experienced enough to have that background um, already from our previous work. And then, so when did you guys uh, officially launch your first product, which I think was the headphones, right? Yeah. So we launched our first uh, headphones product in the, uh, over holiday 2014. Uh, okay. And then have been working on the Sona, our connected bracelet wearable technology uh, for the past couple of years to be able to launch that last year, 2016. What was your go-to-market strategy in the beginning with the headphones? Yeah, so we wanted to focus on, you know, really being an authentic brand where we were in the space. There are a lot of headphone brands out there and what differentiates us is, you know, the design, the brand behind that. Uh, we're kind of targeting a little bit different consumer and trying to speak to people very authentically that they that may not have been um, you know considered in, in more mainstream headphone marketing uh, and brand language. So from that perspective, we started very much directly online. It's a great way to connect directly with the consumer, uh, and then we're very considered about how we rolled out into which retail channels. So focusing on you know headphone boutiques. Uh, focusing on you know, different department stores that would be a, a good match for who our customer is. Because I mean, the price the price point that you guys have on the website, one forty nine for the Linnea on ear headphones, is very mm -hmm. reasonable. I mean, I've seen similar headphones going for two fifty to three fifty in stores. Yeah, and and that's really what we wanted to do. I think one of the big benefits of you know working with David, my co founder, is that. Since we both lived in China, when he's doing the initial design work, he can think about it from a manufacturing perspective as well so that we can get really high quality components and great materials, but built in a way that's designed for manufacturability so that we can get all of that done at a more affordable price point and you're not you know, throwing away money in high scrap rates and you know things that aren't designed for the process that builds them. Now, for a lot of people starting the company, you know, with, with a, a product involved, with prototypes, manufacturing, I, I think the manufacturing aspect would probably be the most difficult. But since you already had experience with that, I'm guessing maybe you ran into some road bumps or some speed bumps, but you, you guys probably didn't have any big issues with the manufacturing. So what have been the biggest challenges 
over the last three years with starting and growing this company? Yeah, well, I, I would say anybody who's worked in manufacturing knows that something will always go wrong, um, oh, no matter sure. how experienced you are, right? It's more about a question of how do you respond to that um, and how do you plan for it, right? I'd say our biggest challenges have been more around the, you know, learning how to build a quality software experience. Um, and coming from the hardware side of things, that's really where our core skill set was. So we had to, you know, build out a team and work with partners that would allow us to bring that same level of quality on the software experience. So our biggest challenges really were on the integration of the two um, and all of the third parties that you have to deal with, whether it's, you know, chip suppliers and the code from their side, you know, firmware, software, full stack development. Um, there's a lot of room for, you know, potential issues and bugs in there. This is Jonah Lupton, founder of the Lupton Group and host of the Startup Sense podcast. Are you struggling to find the right tech team to build your company's website or mobile app? Maybe you've developed a product but need help with your go-to-market strategy, including branding and marketing. Well, stop worrying because my team at the Lupton Group can assist you with all of those needs. We specialize in helping entrepreneurs and startups of all sizes launch and grow their businesses. For a free consultation, you can email me at jonahlupton at gmail.com or visit our website at luptongroup.co. Now, how have you been able to keep the team so lean, so small at this point? Uh, well, a lot of the a, lo- a lot of the work that goes into the hardware side of things, you know, we've been able to leverage our relationships in Asia. Um, we also have a really good network of people that we can use on a contract or freelance basis. I think in order to build a startup uh, that is doing everything from the hardware design to, you know, software, electrical engineering, everything in between, you know, you'd end up with a team of 20, 30, 40 people before you lose a proven product market fit, which is not really feasible from a budget perspective. So we took advantage of our relationships in the industry to you know, bring on people full time that we, we needed to really you know, run the brand and constantly be working on it. And then you know, we used uh, friends and others in the industry uh, for freelance and specific particular uh, tasks that we needed as they came up. So you raised $1.6 million in the seed round back in 2014. Uh, just yep. tell us a little bit how you went. You know, what was your strategy for fundraising? Were you focused on any particular investors? Um, and I mean, and, you know, this is always interesting. How many people did you have to pitch in order to close that round? <laughs> um, actually, let me open up my spreadsheet here. I can tell you right now. Um, <laughs> It, it was a it was an interesting experience for me because I I'd, I'd been in the industry for a really long time but I'd been on the execution side of things um, I hadn't been you know on the side where I'd be out doing fundraising uh, so you know my approach at first was a little bit scattershot to be honest um, you know I was pretty much speaking to anybody that I knew in the venture capital industry uh, and a lot of people will take meetings with you even though you're obviously not a good fit either due to stage or the type of company that you are because, you know, venture capitalists want to know what's going on in the industry. Right. So I probably pitched, uh, l- looking at my list here, almost 100 uh, wow. different people, either, you know, through initial introductory emails, way less than that actually in person. Um, yeah, right. But in terms of, you know, we ended up with about – yeah, I'd say we end up with 11 investors in that round. So you know, 10% is not that bad overall batting average on, on this type of thing. But I definitely learned a lot from that process of how to understand what the you know, venture capitalists are looking for, um, what stage they're in, what types of specialties they have in terms of industry, uh, whether they're interested in investing in a hardware company at all, which is a big one. You know, a lot of people aren't um, or don't have that expertise and, uh, and find it uh, out of their comfort zone. So, you know, from that, we were really able to um, build some good relationships and figure out, you know, who you'd want to uh, kind of keep in touch with going forward and who you kind of have a nice introductory conversation with and then realize it's not a good fit. No, thank you for sharing the numbers. I just think it's it's an eye-opening stat because I think some of the people that, you know, that I know that have tried to raise money and have given up, you know, they get to investor number 20 or 21 or 30 and they, and they give up because they just get a lot of no's. And it seems like a lot of my <laughs> recent guests that I've been an- asking that question to have pitched well over 50 and in some cases closer to 100 investors before they finally fill out their round. So 
Yes. Well, my, my exact number here based off my tracking spreadsheet is 94. So I got 11 <laughs> investors out of the 94 that I spoke with, if uh, that makes anybody else feel better. <laughs> so someday when you sell this company for hundreds of millions of dollars, you're going to go email those other, what, 83 <laughs> investors and rub it in their face, right? Uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll probably be a little <laughs> bit more magnanimous. I hope. Uh, I so, hope. So talk to us about the investors. What is, you know, what kind of value are they adding to the company? And is there any single piece of advice that stands out as, you know, maybe the best? Yeah. So I think, obviously, I didn't necessarily know this when I was first starting. And this is why it took me some time to narrow it down to people who were a good fit. Um, but, you know, for example, the the lead investors in our round is Innovation Ventures. Um, they are the... Um, early stage fund of that's managed by uh, Kai Fu Lee, who is the founding president of Google China and previously an executive at Microsoft and Apple China. So, you know, we were connected through them through our Asia relationship and they have a very strong uh, technology background. Um, and so that they've been ex- extremely great investors and, you know, strong supporters of us. So I think it was a, a question of, you know, finding somebody that could, add that value, you know, they've got the technology background and network both across a- across Asia and the U.S. Um, and it's also about personally, who are you dealing with, you know, from that fund? And so, you know, when you have to talk with that person all the time, get advice. You know, I always say uh, whenever I go into a meeting with Chris, who, you know, our contact there and is on the board, you know, I come out feeling better, which is not always the, uh, the case with investors. And some of our other, you know, really great investors that we have on board. Also, we have Rock Health, which gave us a very good perspective on the healthcare industry, which is not an area that we have focus on uh, initially. But we always knew that there are applications for what we're doing um, in in healthcare. So it's good to have, you know, advice and guidance there, even if it's not where we're focused uh, currently. And then also on the um, brand side, we also were invested in by Brand Foundry Ventures uh, here in New York, uh, and Andrew Mitchell, who was the, the managing partner of that, previously invested in you know, Birchbox and Warby Parker, Harry Shave Club. So he's got a really great um, background of you know, successful e-commerce brands. So I think it's, it's a good example of you know, between innovation on the technology side, um, Rock Health on the health side and the science side, um, and Brand Foundry on the brand side, we really get a good um, background for people who are um, helping us in these different areas that are important aspects of the company. Now, how have you gotten into some of your, you know, your retail partner companies? Uh, you rattled off a few of them in the uh, in the pre-call. I'm already blanking on the names right now. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what were some of them again, and, and how did you build those relationships? Yeah, so you know, we we sell, for example. Um, here in, in the U.S., we sell it Urban Outfitters. Um, we sell in U.K., we sell at Selfridges. You know, we've been very focused on these types of places that you know, are a good fit for our customer. Um, I think coming from larger consumer electronics brands, it's always um, been tempting to go after you know, a big fish uh, that's going to have you know, 1,000 or 2,000 doors. But it, it also comes with a, a lot of risk when you try and go after – uh, those larger retailers right off the bat before you really understand who your customer is and how you'd likely perform in that environment. So, um, you know, we we spent a lot of time and we still do, you know, majority of our business online. Um, and that allowed us to, with all of the data that we get, really understand and the conversations that we can have directly with the customers um, to, to understand who's really buying our product and why. Uh, and, and why uh, they believe in it. And then it's a lot easier to, when you're going to speak with someone like an Urban Outfitters um, or any of these other uh, retailers, you can say, this is who our customer already is, and this is how it lines up with who your customer is, um, and we think that will be successful in your environment, and it's based off of real data rather than, um, you know, conjecture or, you know, just a kind of pretty PowerPoint presentation. Now, do your retail partners typically buy the inventory from you up front, or are they paying, you know, doing like a net 30, net 60, or net 90? Yeah, most retailers in the industry um, will be like net 30 or net 90 unless it's um, somebody who's fairly small and, and, you know, would be considered risky. 
net 30 or net 60. And net 60 is pretty standard across the board, I'd say. So how, I mean, from, from your standpoint, managing, you know, the capital or the, the cash outlay up front and then having to wait for that money to come back, is that, I mean, how risky was that? How much of a concern was that when you guys went into retail? That's always a concern. Um, you know, luckily we have our manufacturing relationships, so we get pretty good terms on that side. I think better than most early stage startups would get. Um, but that's one of the reasons that I always would caution other people, uh, you know, and ourselves as well to focus on smaller door counts first to make sure that you're going to sell through because actually the worst thing that you can do is take a huge order, you know, finance the whole thing with the inventory that you need to do to fulfill that and then get all of it back and sometimes not in saleable condition because the sell through is not there. So even with larger retailers, uh, I'd recommend that, you know, doing a, you know, 10, 50, 100 store trial first so that you're limiting the amount of exposure, inventory exposure, um, both in terms of the money that you have to put in and also in terms of uh, the inventory risk and, and not wanting to burn those relationships um, with with a failed um, large-scale launch. So you know, we've been very strategic about that and focusing on you know, choosing retailers that we know are a good fit and going into smaller door counts first and expanding from there so that everybody is basing, you know, not only their estimation of the success of the program, but also, you know, what are realistic sell-through numbers? So how much inventory should we really be putting in this channel so you don't end up in a uh, over-inventory situation? So we know that the industries that you're in, you know, hardware, software, wearables, they, they move quick, right? There's a lot of innovation. So how does a startup like yours stay ahead of some of the competitors when it comes to innovation and R&D? Yeah, so... On our side of things, I mentioned very briefly at the beginning, uh, for Sona, one of our big uh, differentiating features from the technology side of things is our ability to measure heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is a really interesting metric. Uh, Like I mentioned, the research goes back to the 1960s um, in the Russian cosmonaut program, and we actually have as our scientific advisors uh, Evgeny and Branya Vashilo, uh, Evgeny Vashilo was actually the lead researcher for the you know, biometric uh, and physiology side of things for the Russian cosmonaut program from 1968 onwards. So a lot of this research has been kind of pioneered by him and colleagues, uh, and we are able to draw on that for how we utilize this metric. Uh, and we're, we're really excited to be able to take you know, a lifetime of research that's been proven to show how you know, measuring heart rate variability helps understand what's going on in your nervous system and the balance of your stress and relaxation response. That's very well established. But also the resonance breathing meditation techniques are based off of research uh, that he's done along with Branya that prove, you know, how th- this specific type of breathing technique works within your nervous system to help build resilience to stress. And it's been proven effective uh, in research studies across you know, asthma, PTSD, alcoholism, all sorts of different types of treatments. So we're really excited to be able to, you know, be working with them uh, to take that research and build it into a consumer product. And there's really a lot to build from. Um, So I think we have a one, it's obviously finding good partners and we have a very deep kind of research uh, background and well to draw from with those partners. But on the other side, it's, it's about as a brand and as a technology company, having a focus that's different than others. You know, if we're, if we were trying to go up directly against Fitbit or Apple or Samsung or any of these people with, you know, billions of dollars, we would obviously have a very difficult time, but because we're focusing on a different use case, we're a different type of brand. uh, Even though we are smaller, people who are interested more in the focus on, you know, wellness, on meditation, on stress, um, but also want to have, you know, really great high quality activity tracking, uh, can find us and understand how we're different than some of the giants in the space who, you know, have a lot more money to promote, um, and, and to invest in, in their, uh, in their research as well. So you've worked for some really, really good companies that we all know, you know, we've recognized the names. What is it like being the CEO now? You know, what is it like being <laughs> an entrepreneur running your own company? Um, there's a lot of additional things that you don't even think about when you're the one executing on a product, right? So 
at everything from, you know, the fundraising to managing people and managing the team and keeping everybody excited, you know, making sure that the communication is there across the board. Um, you know, it's, um, it's very, very different than being in an executional role. You know, I'd, I'd been in managerial roles before, but never where I was responsible for everybody. Um, so it's definitely been a pretty steep learning curve. I'd say i am I've, I've uh, adapted to it over the course of the past couple of years, but looking at, for example, the, uh, the fundraising methodology that I talked to you about at first, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but I think a lot of that can be overcome with persistence and, um, right, right. <laughs> do you wish you had taken it? Just keep on trying until you get it right. right. <laughs> Say again? Do you, do you wish you had taken a different approach to fundraising? Is there anything that you would do differently next time? Well, or you have to do I it all do. over? I do differently now, um, but at that time, that was really the best that I could have could have done, and I don't think it would have been realistic to, you know, expect myself as a first time entrepreneur to to really know much differently going into it. You know, some people going into their startups have more background on the fundraising side of things. I had more background on the you know execution and product development side, which obviously I think helped me. In other areas, uh, nobody's going to have experience in everything, so right. you just have to learn how to do wh- or help or get somebody to help you uh, with the areas that you don't know how. So, you know, obviously, I- I've learned a lot from that, and I wouldn't do it the same way twice. But having done it that way the first time wasn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Outside of fundraising, what's the the skill that you've had to learn the fastest over the last few years? I would say management, uh, particularly of areas that aren't my core focus, right? So as a mechanical engineer, there's a specific technical depth that I have. Um, but, you know, our product is very complicated and our team spans a lot of different areas. So for me, it's been very important to recruit people that I can trust in those specific subject areas and find the fine balance between you know, managing and communicating with them and, and not being kind of controlling, you know, trusting that the people that I've hired have that specific expertise that I hired them for. And, you know, that's that's why they're on the team and working together with them to, to best allow them to execute to, to those abilities. What's your biggest flaw? My biggest flaw? Yeah, do you uh, have one? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has one. If they yeah. so, uh, <laughs> Some people don't want to admit it, but we all have them. I would say that actually going back to the point I was just making, you know, coming from um, a technical background, I sometimes like to get very into the details. And it's important, like I said, to to delegate and allow people to focus on that so I can focus on the high level. Because a lot of times, you know, I think particularly people coming from an engineering background feel like if they don't. Uh, know 100% of what's going on all the time, um, then they'll be missing something. But if you focus so much on the weeds, then you can also miss a lot on the 10,000 foot view, which is really where as an executive, you know, you need to be pointing everybody in the right direction. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good their detailed work is. Right. Absolutely. Um, So in terms of your current marketing strategy versus, you know, your marketing strategy when you guys first launched the first product in uh, late 2014. How is how has that message changed, or how has that strategy changed, and what kinds of paid marketing channels are you guys using right now? Yeah. So when we first started, um, you know, we had the headphones product uh, coming out with Sona really allowed us to add a lot more depth to the brand because now we have all of the science, all of the kind of wellness messaging and conversations that we want to have, um, and it's also helped us, I think as a brand become a little bit more approachable, um, you know, rather than just focusing on something based off aesthetics and feature set. Now we're talking about, you know, people's health and wellness, which is a um, really a very personal area. So it's allowed us as a brand to have more direct communication and relationships uh, with our customers, with our users, which I think has been a great growing experience for the brand overall. In terms of uh, paid channels, you know, we spend a lot of um, budget on, you know, Facebook. I think Facebook's a great way to find people uh, that are going to have affinity with their, our brand for a number of different reasons, whether it's because, um, you know, our all of our activity tracking is based off of heart rate and they're a rock climber or they do yoga or spy, cycling, a spin class. Um, you know, that's a, those are specific groups of people that, 
have really appreciated our very accurate heart rate sensor and how we do our activity tracking that's not step-based, right? Or on the other side, you know, people who uh, are in high-stress positions and careers and they appreciate the uh, meditation coaching and the stress tracking um, feature set. So we've been able to, and then there's also a group of people who appreciate this for, you know, purely for the aesthetic reasons, for the bracelet in particular, they, you know, want something that looks more like a traditional piece of jewelry and doesn't have a big screen on it. Um, and those are all different groups of people that uh, appreciate our brands for different reasons. And I think, you know, Facebook is a great way to to find those groups of people and connect with them. Um, we also do, you know, Instagram as well. Um, as we have a very visually appealing product, it works great on that platform. Um, and, you know, obviously going off into, into other channels, we, we focus on what channel specific marketing we can do. Yeah. The headphones are, are beautiful. I love the way they look. And if I buy a pair, I'm, I'm stuck between the carbon and gunmetal versus the ceramic and rose gold. I love ceramic, but, uh, I'm not sure I can pull off the rose gold. So, <laughs> well, you know, we, we do, we do get, uh, we are, you know, try, try to be a brand that can, you know, work for men and women across the different colorways. We do have some, some guys who rock the white rose gold and, uh, make it work for them, but it, it depends on your own personal style. We, we understand that, which is why we've got the, uh, the carpet and gun metal version as well. If you're trying to go a little bit more stealth with your style. <laughs> what are some of the KPIs that you look at the most often? Yeah. So when we're looking at um, across the board, obviously um, conversion and, you know, on the sales side of things, it helps us understand um, how, our messaging and how, you know, how we're finding the right people um, to who want to be a part of the brand who are interested in making a purchase. That's obviously a huge one. Um, from the engagement side of things for people who are already using the device, you know, obviously we look at, you know, daily, weekly, monthly active users uh, for, for people who have the bracelet already, um, as well as, you know, the time spent in the app. You know, we've been really excited that, you know, our average session length is like almost six minutes um, across the board. So people are really, the people who are engaged are very engaged and getting a lot of value out of the time that they spend. Um, so those are some, some really great ones for us. And then obviously in the retail channels, we're looking at sell through um, and reorder. Are you able to share with us what percentage of your overall sales come through the, come through the website versus through retail? About 60, 40. Okay. Uh, towards the website. Yeah. And uh, over the next year, are you guys more focused? Which, which side would you like to see grow faster, the online or the retail? We'd like to grow them both. I think that now, you know, we've built enough information about the right way to target things and move ahead that, um, you know, we can take advantage of that both in our direct sales and scaling that as well as uh, getting into some larger retail channels that we're now confident we'll be successful in. And last question here, what is your number one goal for 2017? Yeah, our number one goal for 2017 is, you know, getting the Sona on more people's wrists um, and connecting with them and learning more about their own wellness goals and how we can uh, improve our, our app experience, our product experience to help them with that. Awesome. Uh, what's the best way that we can find you online and, and uh, of course, the company? I mean, I'll put the website, uh, Caden.com, in the show notes. But uh, you personally, are you on any social media or if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do it? Yeah, so my social media handle pretty much across the board is Nora Lev, N-O-R-A-L-E-V. Um, and, you know, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, everything that way. And cool. For the company, all of our handles are Caden Official. So Caden, C-A-E-D-E-N, Official, uh, on Instagram, on Twitter, and everything like that. Where did that name came from? Caden. So yeah. we we liked uh, the kind of similarity with Cadence and it being working both from the music side of things as well as talking about you know biometrics and uh, the activity side as well. We, we wanted something that was uh, not so literal, which I think is uh, – easy to get caught up in, in a, a tech company. Cool. And how much did you pay for Kaden.com? Are you willing to share? <laughs> <laughs> how much did we pay for it? Actually, yeah. we, we just, we just got it. It was, nobody had taken it. So really it was available. It was, it was available. <laughs> Sweet. So that, like that also helped us. That helped us uh, 
help you pick yeah, the definition. name. <laughs> right. well, there, there are also a lot of cute babies named Caden. So, you know, if, if our options when people uh, Google us are, you know, our product and then cute babies, I think it puts you in the right mood. <laughs> that is a great naming strategy. I like it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Laura. Really enjoyed talking to you today. Uh, thanks for sharing your journey with us. And, you know, if anything big happens, feel free to come back and, and tell us all about it. Great. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. You got it. Talk to you soon, Nora. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.